Good morning, my friends. I hope you are well. I missed you last week. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to read together. We're going to read a couple of times together this week. We are about halfway through our book. See that? So um, we're going to read a couple of times this week. We have, I think, a couple of weeks left together. So I want to make sure that we can get through, if not the whole thing, as far as we can um, before the end of our school year, which is coming up way too fast. Um, and of course, don't forget, this book is in our library. So, um, so if you want to read it by yourself, you absolutely can borrow it next time you're in the library. All right, so here we go. Uh, we're in chapter 23. Hank was waiting for me at the motel when I got back from school. What are you doing home so early? I asked. Usually he didn't get home until well past six. The cops came around to the gas station. They started asking me questions, asking my employer, he said. And I asked him. He stared into the tiny lines of the front desk wood. And my boss freaked out and fired me. I felt the floor beneath me open up and swallow me whole. What? But you didn't do anything wrong. Doesn't matter. The boss said it was bad for business having the cops poke around. Hank pulled out a crumpled $100 bill from his pocket and slid it across the desk. This here's my last paycheck, he said. I looked at the bill on the table. What are you going to do, I asked him. He didn't say anything. He just gazed out the window at the leaves in the pool. Hank, I said loudly, you have to fight this. Hank shook his head. You don't get it, kid, he said. I've been fighting my whole life. I'm done. I'm no use... It's no use fighting. People are going to be the way they're going to be. After Hank went back to his room, I searched the kitchen for canned food. If that was his last paycheck and he'd just given it to us, he was going to need all the help he could get. I was in the middle of rummaging through our fridge when I heard a knock at the door. It was a security guard from the Topaz Inn two doors down, a Chinese guy about my parents' age, probably second or third generation from the confident way he spoke English. Open up. I gotta talk to you, he hollered. I buzzed him in. I heard you guys got a little visit from the cops, he said. A sly grin stretched across his face. The Topaz Inn people did not like us, and we didn't like them. To say that we had a little rivalry was an understatement. Every day they tried to undercut our prices. They had a bigger motel, so naturally they had more rooms. But we had a better location, being the first motel on our block. You had to drive past us to get to the Topaz Inn, which drove them nuts. The Topaz people came up with all kinds of ridiculous tactics to get back at us, including one time when they had one of their people stand a few blocks away with a sign that said, Don't dare, don't stay at the Cala Vista. It's full of roaches. Stay at the Topaz. Mr. Yao happened to be driving by that day. When he saw what they were doing, he went straight to her house bought a dozen eggs, and hurled them at the sign. So it was quite a shock to the Topaz security guard standing here in my lobby. What do you want, I asked him. Look, I know we've had our differences over the years, he said, but in light of what's happened, I've come to offer a truce. I stared at him. A truce? He nodded. What happened over here last night was a tragedy, he said. We were so upset when we heard about it. Really? I said. I would have thought they'd be celebrating. Really? He said. No, now look, it's neither of our, it's in neither of our interests if bad people stay at our motels. It gives the area a terrible rip and business suffers. So why don't we do this? He pulled out a piece of paper. This here is a list of all the bad people we've checked in the past month, he said. I peered curiously at his list. I'm sure you have a few names of your own you'd like to add to it, he said. I did, starting with a drunk guy. So here's what we're going to do. You tell me the names of your bad people, and I'll tell you the names of our bad people. I'm going to show you the list to the lagoon to show the list to the Lagoon Motel, people on the other stores on our street, so we're all in on it. And if anybody from the list calls for a room, we'll tell them the same thing. No vacancy. How's that? I nodded. It sounded like a plan. I thought back to all the things that had happened these last few weeks. We could sure use more safety around here. All right, then, he said. He took out his pen, and I took out my dad's big ledger with all the customers' names and information. Ready, he asked. Ready, I said. He grinned. He grinned, revealing a mouthful of very yellow teeth. Let's start with the last month. Give me the names of all the black customers 
who have come through here in the last month, he said. I slammed the ledger shut. Get it, get out, I said, pointing at the door. Hey, no need to get worked up, he said, holding his hands up. I'm just trying to help. Get out, I repeated. Suit yourself, he huffed as he walked out, stuffing his list into his pocket. But don't come crying to me when this place gets robbed again, which it will. Chapter 24 I rocked back and forth with the ledger in my arms, waiting for Lupe. I called her as soon as the awful security guard left. As her dad's car pulled in, the air howled of a, of a coming storm. We have got to sneak over there and grab those lists, I said to Lupe. I couldn't wait to rip them to shreds. Lupe shook her head. She flopped down at the front desk. That won't do any good, she said. We'd get caught, and besides, the stores probably already have copies. Lupe helped herself to a blank piece of white paper from the fax machine and started drawing with a pencil. Lupe was always drawing buildings, people, dogs, cats, mountains, and most of all, trees. She loved trees. Will you stop drawing? I all but shouted at her. Lupe put her pencil down and gave me a look. The things about prejudice is that you can't tell people not to be prejudiced. You've got to show them. It's like writing. I thought back to what Mrs. Douglas was always saying. you got to show, not tell. But can't you tell people? I asked, because they won't listen. It'll go in the ear and out the other, she said. So how do we show them, I asked. She pointed to the ledger still in my arms. Who was here last night, she asked. Does it stay? Who was here that night, she asked. Does it stay in there? I opened the ledger to the day that the car got stolen and ran my fingers down the list of customers. There were five customers who left in the middle of the night. They were Peter Riotti, Rebecca Thompson, Tommy Smith, Javier Roberto, Loretta Robinson. Next to their names, we copied down all their permanent addresses so that in case they left something, I could mail it back to them. The addresses sprawled as far as San Diego and as far north as Sacramento. Have the police checked out these addresses yet? Lupe asked. I shook my head. To my knowledge, they didn't even have them. Well, what are you waiting for? Lupe asked. Call them up. The customers? No, the police. My eyes widened. We'd never called the police before, not even on the day the car got stolen. Mr. Yao had been the one to call. Back in China, I had found memories of, I had fond memories of the policemen. We used to call them uncles, too. They'd help the elderly cross the road and find their way home if they got lost. I'm not even sure if they had guns. We'd sing songs in school about them, songs like, If I was walking down the street um, and, and I found a penny, I'd give it to Uncle Policeman. Things were different here. Here the policemen had guns. And if you found a penny, I'm sure you'd keep it. I know my dad and I wouldn't. I went over the drawer under the phone system and retrieved the card. Officer Phillips Pinibus, excuse me, he was the officer in charge of the case. I picked up the phone, dialed the number, and handed the receiver to Lupe. You talk, I told her. Lupe pushed the receiver hard away. Away hard. <laughs> no, this is your motel. You need to talk, she said. Hesitantly, I put the receiver up to my ear. Officer Phillips pick up, picked up the fourth ring. Hi, Officer Phillips. It's uh, Mia Tang calling from the Cala Vista Motel, I said. The what? The Cala Vista. You know, the motel where the car was stolen the other day. Listen, kid, I've got a lot of work to do, he said. He sounded really annoyed to hear from me. I looked at Lupe, who nudged me to go on. I just wanted to ask you if you're looking into all the customers that left early that night. I have all their home addresses here. I can give them to you right now if you'd like, I said. Will you let us do just do our job, kid? He said, we already have a strong lead. You mean Hank? I said, he didn't do it. How many times did I have to keep saying it? And by the way, did you know the guys fired him from his job? He recently got fired from his job? Officer Phillips's voice perked up. That explains why he needs the money. No, you guys got him fired. His boss saw you guys asking him questions and fired him, I told him. Now he doesn't have a job. There was silence on the other end. I looked over at Lupe. Well, that's unfortunate, Officer Phillips said, but I'm sure there was more to it than that. I shook my hand into the phone. No, there wasn't. Look, I really have to work now, he said. So that's it then? You're just going to give up? You're not even going to look into the addresses, I asked him. We're not giving up. We just have more press more pressing cases to deal with at the moment involving 
armed robbery. And what about Mr. Lawrence? What's he supposed to do? Oh, let's, he's fine. I talked to him the other day. Already filed claims with his insurance. Gonna get his money in 30 days. The good thing about this case is nobody got hurt, said Officer Phillips. And with that, he hung up the phone. Yeah, nobody except Hank. I stared at the phone in my hand. I couldn't believe that Officer Phillips. We have to call his manager, I told Lupe. He must have a manager. Lupe shook her head. It doesn't sound like this is a top priority for them. Well, it should be, you'd think. What should we do? I looked down at the list of addresses. We can't go all the, all, to all these places by ourselves. Maybe the car will turn up, said Lupe. Maybe someone will see it and call and put in a call. Maybe. Chapter 25. As Lupe was leaving the motel, a car pulled in and someone got out. My dad and I went to greet out to greet her. It was another Im immigrant. My mother's face softened when she saw I was a woman this time. Aunt Ling was a friend of Uncle Lee's, and she was so fam famished, she practically inhaled the dumplings my mother made at dinner. Eat up, there's plenty here, my mother said, even though I knew that wasn't really true. In between bites, the woman told us where she'd been working at a nail salon down in Irvine, California. Irvine, California. Irvine, my dad said, that's supposed to be nice. Isn't that by the beach? My mom asked. Well, I never got to see it, Aunt Lang said. I spent the entire time hunched over, kneeling on the floor. She told us how she would hold the hands of wealthy American women as they complained right in front of her about their Chinese maids and how they were probably taking things because don't they all steal? It was like I wasn't even there. They didn't even see me, she said. I was just a nail clipper to them. My mother reached for Aunt Ling's hang. Well, we we'll see you, she said. My mother led Aunt Ling over to the room one over to room one, our best room. Aunt Ling was so touched by our hospitality the next day she insisted on doing my mother's nails. Oh, that's very nice of you, but it's not necessary, my mother said bashfully, tucking her hands under her armpit to hide them from Aunt Lang. Let me see, Aunt Lang insisted. Don't be shy. Yeah, Mom, come on, let, let's let see, I said. Reluctantly, my mom put her hands in, out in front. We gasped. My mother's once shiny, smooth fingernails were now dry, yellow, and rough. The cleaning supplies she used every day to clean the rooms must have somehow seeped through her gloves and into her nails. Her nails were practically melting off her hands. It's been like this for weeks, my mom said, tears coming to her eyes. I don't know what to do. It's all that Ajax and bleach. Don't panic. I know just the thing, Aunt Ling said. She got up and went into the kitchen where she grabbed a cut up lemon from the fridge and baking soda from the cupboard. Next, she filled two bowls of warm water. She put the baking soda in the bowls and soaked my mom's hands in them. After half an hour, she lifted each hand up and scrubbed the nails with a lemon. I watched as she worked, scrubbing and drying, polishing and cleaning. When she was finally done, the nails looked transformed. She was able to get rid of most of the roughness, and and what she couldn't get off, she covered up with a coat of glossy red nail polish. My mom was beaming. Quick, take a picture, my mom said. I smiled and kneeled down before her, and Aunt Ling. I pretended with, I pretended click with my fingers as my mother held her beautiful manicured hand out to the camera. Eggplant, I said. As we waited for my mother's nail polish to dry, I asked Aunt Ling where she was heading next. Sacramento, she announced. There are some new nail salons opening up there. You're going to Sacramento, I asked. One of the addresses from the ledger was in Sacramento. I leaped out of my chair and raced over to the front desk to get the ledger. Can you do me a favor? Can you swing by this address? I need you to check something out for me. Aunt Lang promised she'd go by the address when she got up to Sacramento. If the Thunderbird were there, she'd call me right away. Before she left, she asked my mom whether she could tell any of her friends about the Calavista. They could really use a place to stay. Their boss gave them the boot, and they're living out of their cars, she said. Oh, that's hard, my mom said, grimacing. We've been there. My parents exchanged a look. The only thing is our boss, Mr. Yao, my dad said. He lives right down, right here in Anaheim. Sometimes he doesn't come for weeks, though, I reminded them. He has motels all over the place. Aunt Ling put a well-manicured finger to her chin. You know what would be great? Excuse me, if you guys had a sign or something for when he's here, she thought out loud. You mean a don't come in sign? I chuckled. 
Yeah, but not something he'd understand, she said, a secret sign that only we understand. I looked around the front desk. My eyes fell on an old blue Yankees baseball cap. I picked it up. How about this? I asked Aunt Ling. Her eyes widened. Yes, she exclaimed. That's perfect. My friends, we're going to stop here. I hope you have a great Monday. Um, check back again in a few days, and we're going to read a few more chapters of our book. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Tell me how you're doing. Um, I miss you terribly. I miss our time at the library. I hope um, I hope you guys are doing well. Remembering to wash your hands, of course. Um, and I um, I will see you here in a few days. Um, goodbye, guys.